Welcome to another episode of Yarn to Table. I'm Celeste, and this is a show about my knitting life. This is episode 50, which I just realized like a minute ago. Um, and I probably would have done something special to celebrate if it had occurred to me before then, but um, what are you going to do? I guess we'll just say happy 50th episode. Um, thanks everybody for coming back yet again. And I have some fun stuff to share with you today. If you're not aware, we do have a year-long knit-along going on right now called the Five Request Cal. All the info for that is linked in the doobly-doo. There is a uh, playlist with um, an intro video that gives you the rundown of the cal and then um, lots of videos about different plant fibers, or different fibers, <laughs> plant and animal fibers. Um, that we've been trying out all year. So right now we are knitting with silk and that is running through the end of August. Um, and you can share your progress and help each other out and share your finished objects for a chance to win um, in the Ravelry group. I have not uh, mentioned in a while, um, not since I picked this up, but this is going to be the prize for the Land of Silk, this beautiful skein of Noro. Um, so this is called Silk Garden, uh, and it is 45% silk, 45% mohair, and 10% wool. Um, so it's a really interesting, uh, slightly rustic, kind of completely unique uh, fiber. And as you can see, um, it's got a lot of interesting color going on as well. Um, so that's going to be the prize for the winner of the Land of Silk. And after that, we will be moving on to breed-specific wool, anything but merino, which will be September, October. Um, today is uh, a little bit hot here in the Midwest. I think it's pretty hot everywhere right now. Um, <laughs> so I've got some iced tea going on, and uh, this is kind of a special thing I've whipped up for myself. Um, it's one of the David's Tea strawberry blends. I can't remember which one. Uh, in... And I just, I did that as like a concentrate with hot water, and then I filled it up with cold, um, which is a way a lot of people make iced tea. However, when I filled it up with cold, I used um, sparkling water, and I actually uh, carbonated myself with a soda stream, so I just went ahead and I made it like extra carbonated to kind of balance out the flat water that was used to make the tea, so that it would all come together as sort of a normal level of carbonated iced tea uh, situation. I sweetened it with a little bit of local wildflower honey um, and it is really lovely. I've been quite into this quart size mason jar lately. I think because it's summer I want like a lot of beverage um, so I've been having coffee in it some mornings to be honest which is a lot of coffee. Um, to be honest I really only fill it up halfway and then I just fill the rest of it with ice and um, it keeps me going for a couple hours like that. I mean a couple hours of drinking it, not like I need more coffee in a couple hours, whatever. Um, so yeah. So today I have a finished object to share with you. I also have a near finished um, sweater. We'll get, we'll get into that. My finished object is the socks that I've been making for Ryan. Um, I, I decided not to show these on sock blockers because my sock blockers are a little bit too small for his socks anyway. Um, and I think I showed you one of the, them on sock blockers the last time, but these are made out of nomadic yarns, um, Brit Sock Base, I think it's called, yeah, which is her BFL base, um, and the self-striping colorway is called Knit Folk, inspired by Jacqueline Salem of Brooklyn Knit Folk, her sort of color palette, uh, and I did the Fish Lips Kiss heels in my uh, leftovers from my Tenya. Uh, which is Woolen Vine, um, Dirty on Purpose, on her BFL base, Footsie. So they're both two-ply BFL bases, and they look basically exactly the same. I mean, they blend beautifully together, which I really like, and I really like how this colorway plays uh, against the stripes. So very happy with that. I do modify my Fish Lips Kiss to go to a much pointier heel when I make them for myself, and for the first time I'm trying doing that for Ryan's to see if he will like them. Uh, the next pair of socks I knit for him, I believe I'm going to try a heel flap and gusset and see if he likes that better. 
Um, but I don't like doing that on self-striping for obvious reasons because the gusset can screw up the width of the stripe. Um, yeah. I did two by two here because I think it looks a little bit homier, a little bit more handmade, and I liked that look with uh, this particular yarn. Um, and he is a big fan of these. I actually had a bit of a sock -a -thon yesterday, knitting most of the heel and the whole foot of the second one um, because his birthday is this week and I wanted to uh, surprise him with them. I mean, he knows that I'm working on them for him, but um, I thought it would be nice when I leave in the morning and he's still sleeping to put out uh, like a love letter and these socks for him to find when he wakes up because he'll be going to work on his birthday. We're not really going to see each other on his actual birthday. Uh, we're going to be celebrating later. So I thought that would be like a fun little treat. And um, yeah, so I wanted to get them finished. So I just went ahead and uh, zoomed on them yesterday to get that done. Um, and what else is there to say? I mean, the way that they worked out, this is the only thing that I think is a little bit silly. They just have this like one row of uh, the next stripe color here in the toe, which is just what you risk sometimes when you decide to do stripes all the way to the toe instead of a contrasting toe. Um, and I know it won't bug him. It only bugs me a little bit. So what are you going to do? Um, and the yarn is just lovely. I have waxed poetic over this colorway and nomadic yarns, um, self-striping in general many times. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to using her other self-striping ball that I have in my stash for a pair of socks for myself um, coming up here one of these days. But oh, just look at the cross section of these stripes. I mean, mm, just beautiful. Absolutely love these. I'm very, very jealous that they are Ryan's because I would wear the heck out of these socks. So those are done. Moving into works in progress. I have something near finished. Um, I definitely could have finished this for the podcast, but as I was nearing the end of it, um, I was thinking I wanted to dedicate some time to these socks to get them done. And then I thought instead of just having this finished to wear in the podcast, wouldn't it actually be better if I were able to kind of talk a bit more about the construction and show it to you, because it's very interesting construction. Um, this is, of course, the Wispy Cardigan by Hannah Fettig, uh, which I'm sort of calling my Queenie Cardigan after the colorway, which is uh, Sweet Sparrow Knits, inspired by um, the character Queenie from Fantastic Beasts. And so this is a very interesting construction, as I mentioned. I think the last time you saw it, it was just part of the sleeve. Um, and the sleeves were meant to be knit flat, but I modified it to knit them in the round. And you just kind of start on one end, you do the sleeve. I broke to be flat, but they would have been flat anyway, how it was written, to go across the back here, doing this little kind of gathered place that's gonna go up the middle of your back. And then you just keep going. Um, I brought it to in the round again. It's written for flat do the rest of the sleeve, do the other cuff. Then from that point, you pick up. Um, I also modified it to make it easier to pick up by slipping the first stitch on every row and knitting into the back of the final stitch on every row um, to give it a sort of, uh, that sort of edge, it's actually the same edge that they have written into the pattern here. So it just gives it this nice little slip stitch edge, which is a little bit easier to pick up from. So I did that and you go around and you pick up and that's what this sort of ribbing is here. So essentially you pick up all the way around here and here. So you have this big sort of, <laughs> it's so hard to show, this big sort of in the round rib situation going on, right? And what that creates is the back of the neck here, so you have your sleeves, you have your back of your neck, and then on the back of the cardigan, it's this sort of ribbing right here that's going to go across my mid-back, okay? And once you've done that, you bind off 
for the back of the neck, and you keep going on the rest of it, which turns into this, which is the sort of back of the cardigan, and uh, it is increasing so that it's going to create these sort of points that come into the front. Um, I will pop up a photo of what this, and maybe I have already, um, <laughs> what this full cardigan is going to look like so that that'll all kind of make more sense for you. But I just thought it might be interesting to sort of talk you through how that construction works um, because it is really totally different from anything I've done before or even really seen before. Um, so it's really interesting and it, it definitely helps keep things interesting in a pattern that is mostly just stockinette and ribbing and so could get pretty boring pretty quickly. Um, but it, it's held my interest so far. Now, I've basically finished the bottom. I really just need to do the ribbing, um, so that'll take like a second. And uh, then I believe I am going to rip out this bind off and redo it because I think it's just a little bit too tight. I This is going to go across the back of my neck, and I don't want it to be straining there, obviously. Um, I tried to bind off loosely. I didn't want to do a super stretchy bind off because I didn't want it to flare or to stretch too much. Um, but I think that uh, it could stretch a little bit more. So I'm just going to cut out the bind off and just redo it. Um, just as if you were cutting into your knitting to do like an afterthought heel or whatever, just cut in unravel in both directions, sort of weave in the end and um, catch your live stitches and go from there. Um, I'm not sure exactly how tight it is because it's been difficult to try it on. Every time that I try it on, I send my stitches flying off the ends of my needles and I have to pick them up again. Um, <laughs> so I only have a vague sense that it's too tight. I don't really know how too tight it is. So based on how tight it feels when I try it on, when I finish, uh, I'm going to decide whether I want to actually go for like a stretchy or bind off or whether I maybe just want to try to knit, bind off more loosely. I think the best thing to do is probably going to be to just bind off with a much larger needle uh, while also trying to be loose because I was trying to be loose when I did it. Um, but I was using a regular size needle. So I think that might give me just the extra edge that I need, but I need to try it on to figure out how much extra stretch I actually need. Um, so this is very, very close to being finished, and um, I'm sure I will be wearing it the next time I see you. Um, and yeah, not much else to say. This is a, an MCN base, so knitting with it has been uh, definitely easy on the easy on the hands, easy on the eyes. Um, my little pig has been keeping me um, company while I knit on it. This has become like my new favorite progress keeper. I love him so much. He's so cute. I um, used him all through my Tanya as well. So yeah, not much else to say about this. Excited to have it, excited to wear it. Um, it's the kind of thing I can still wear in the summer when the AC is turned up. It's like a light sort of three quarter length sleeve. Um, cardigan, knit at a very loose gauge, fingering weight. Uh, so even though it is wool and a little bit of cashmere, um, it's it's really something that I think I'm going to find the opportunity to wear immediately when I finish it, which is exciting because uh, as much as I don't like to admit it, we do still have a good bit of summer left here. Um, kids are already going back to school, but in reality, the weather is going to be very hot for like two more months. So yeah, that's kind of icky, but I'll have a cardigan to wear at least. So that is the wispy. Um, the other sweater that I have been working on very slowly uh, is my Sunset Highway, which um, longtime viewers will know. I only knit on this when I record um, Return to Stars Hollow. Uh, so I think I've probably had like one, maybe two sessions since you've last seen it. So the progress is like nothing you'll even notice. I'm in the body at this point. So it's like every time I knit on it, I just make like an inch or two of progress. So it doesn't look like anything. Um, and because of that, I probably will not get it out again 
to show you guys on the podcast until something more interesting is happening. But I did want to show you today because yesterday I decided to uh, put it on waist yarn. I had these on some sort of um, stitch holders and this was on the needle. Um, and I put it all on waist yarn and I steam blocked it so that I could try it on. Um, because I had some puckering going on here and it was just making me a little nervous, I really wanted to feel good about the fit uh, before I just continued knitting on into oblivion. Um, just in case it fit very poorly. It turns out it fits great. It's perfect. So good news. And I'm feeling much more settled about um, how the color work is looking now that I've steam blocked it a little. It still looks a little puckery. I think after a full block, it'll be perfect. Um, I didn't do the nicest job uh, with the color work. I did a lot of this yoke in Magic Loop, which I don't find to be a very easy... Um, well, I did it in Magic Loop with like sort of a shorter cable, and it's just... Anyway, it was just not um, easy to keep my tension how I needed it to be. So there was a little bit of puckering going on. Um, I think it's all going to look fine when it's blocked. And now that I have it steam blocked, I'm feeling more confident about that. Uh, I was a little bit worried. Now I'm not really worried at all. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of getting excited about it. It's still going to be a long time before it's done. Uh, honestly, we're probably going to finish Return to Stars Hollow before I finish this sweater because we're looking at wrapping up around Thanksgiving. Um, and we only have like maybe 11 more episodes and I have all the rest of this body in the sleeves to do. So probably <laughs> uh, we'll be done and then I'll have to finish this on my own time. Um, I mean, it's all my own time, but you know what I'm saying. But uh, yeah, so I would like to finish it by the end of the year. So maybe we'll just see how far we've come and then I can um, finish it up over December or something like that. But I'm getting excited about it. Uh, the reason this is my Return to Stars Hollow project, if any of you don't know, is that all of the yarn is inspired by Gilmore Girls. Um, some of it is from Stress Knits, some from Homespun House, and some from Woolberry Fiber Co. And it's all listed in my um, show notes, which are in the Ravelry group linked below. Um, it's all listed on my page, my project page on Ravelry as well. But, uh, yeah, and then of course I have my little Pop-Tarts and Coffee progress keep around there now. So it's just like Gilmore Girls extravaganza on this project. <laughs> um, and say goodbye because you probably won't be seeing it for a little while until it's a little bit more interesting looking. Um, this was, this pattern was a, a gift during get your yarn wishes granted. Um, so that's sort of a special thing as well as when I, when I knitted, it's like all of the yarn is dyed by various different, um, hand dyers who are also podcasters in the knitting community who I, you know, kind of feel like I know in some way. Um, and then, uh, the, the pattern was gifted to me by, um, someone on Instagram who I think might be a viewer as well. I can't remember. Um, so it, it all feels like very connected. And then when I knit on it, I am talking to my co-host and, um, talking, you know, out to everyone that's listening to, uh, Return to Stars Hollow. So it's kind of interesting because I feel like there's a lot of like community memories and just like friendship energy in that, um, garment, which is kind of nice. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but okay. Next thing is I have been um, adding some squares to the Cozy Memories quilt again. I don't know the last time you guys saw this, but if anyone is not aware, um, you know, these were very popular a little while ago. People haven't really been doing them much anymore, but I've been steadily working on mine. Basically what I do is I add squares to represent actual projects. I want everything to be specifically tied to a memory. So with very few exceptions, these are all representative of projects. And uh, the, the size that I have it at now 
it's 15 by almost six. I've almost completed the sixth row. I want it to be, I think, 15 by 10. And I've been working on it um, for almost two years. Well, it's comprising projects from almost two years back. I actually started it maybe six months after the beginning of the period where the projects come from. But um, so I'm thinking it probably won't be done for another few years. Um, but it is really something at this point. I mean, I'm into it. Uh, I basically go randomly in terms of how the colors play together because I basically just like it to be chronological. And it's funny because the randomness, I feel like, pretty much works. It spreads out different types of um, yarns. I mean, there is a section in here where there's a lot of variegated together, and that's from my uh, advent calendar. So those are all a lot of the same style because they're all a homespun house advent calendar. Um, but yeah, there's also a lot of, you know, kind of weirdos sticking out. Like this was my um, yarn that I unraveled for The Great Unravel, uh, which was a podcast I co-hosted a little while ago, um, like a year and a half ago now, I guess. And there's some mohair in here and just some fun things. But um, what I've added recently is um, the socks that I made in Cambridge last January. And then um, these were yarns from my little brioche bandana cowl. Um, these are the most recent pairs of socks I made in Wales and in Cambridge. This is what I just finished up for Ryan. I just love how self-striping looks in these. It's really fun. Um, my Tanya slash the heels on these socks. And then I've just started adding the um, square, squares for the Sunset Highway, the sweater that I just showed you. So I have uh, this one and I have um, spots for the other three colors, which are going to be coming next. Um, gosh, I really, really love the colors I've been working on lately, like just these last few squares. I think they all look so nice together, too. So, yeah, uh, I work on this with signature needles, little shorty straights, which I find to be very, very comfortable because they're so short, they're so lightweight. These are really good needles. Um, I wanted something special for this project. So these are just for this project. They even have my uh, initials on them. And um, yeah, this is just always kind of a joy and a relaxing thing to knit on. It's a, it's a fun thing to sort of pick up and put down. And I think it's gonna be a really special keepsake one day. So that keeps me motivated to um, keep on it. And I, and I think one of the reasons that I never really lose steam on this is that I don't tend to have huge marathon sessions on it. Um, other than when I did the advent calendar. So then I had to knit in all of those things. And that was a little bit, uh, a little bit of a lot, <laughs> but, um, other than that, because it's so slow going and it's so, about um, just sort of doing a square for every yarn that's in a, a new project. Um, it keeps it something special that I actually want to knit on and not something that feels like a burden. So, so far, um, that's how it feels and that is good. Okay, so now I wanna talk on the horizon and I have a lot of stuff to share for on the horizon. The first thing I want to share is um, my next sweater, which I am about to start. Uh, that's living in my current very, very favorite bag. I actually swapped this out. This had the Return to Stars Hollow project in it, but um, I really wanted to use it more often. <laughs> so I've swapped it out. This is from Peapod Threads. Is that what she's called? Yeah. Just absolutely love this bag. And it has my really cute little pins on it. So this is going to be a swag and if you do not, if you're not good with names of sweaters or maybe you've been living under a rock and you haven't even seen this, uh, this is the swag. It's Caitlin Hunter who also designed the Sunset Highway which I'm uh, working on as well. 
Um, and basically everyone has been knitting this um, for good reason. It's really fun. It's got some color work and some lace in the yoke. I'm very into yoked sweaters right now. So my, um, my plans for this sweater started a few months back when Marta from um, Mad Fuzzy Yarn generously donated some yarn, which is going to be um, prize for next portion of uh, the Fly Request Cal for the, um, the breed specific wool. Uh, she donated some wool for that and she also sent me this, which is for me to keep. Um, and this is some very, very special, completely unique yarn that I knew I had to showcase in something really cool. So the deal with this yarn, if you do not remember back when I got it, um, Marta is based in uh, Maine, and all of her yarn is actually raised, milled, and hand-dyed hand all in Maine, which is very special. Um, and this particular base, the Pretty Tough base, is 80% um, East Frisian wool and 20% Starfire nylon, which is really cool because um, I don't know how well it's picking up on camera, but this actually sparkles almost as dramatically as a Stellina. It's a little bit more subtle than a Stellina. Um, but the sparkle comes from the nylon that is blended in here. And so you don't get, uh, uh, you know, those sort of problems with big, long bits of Stellina breaking and sticking out, which drives me crazy. Um, so <laughs> it's just a really interesting yarn in a few ways. Uh, because it's a non-superwash, more rustic, breed-specific wool, and then because it's been blended with this sparkly nylon, it's just really, really cool. Now, obviously, this would make great socks because it, you've got your nylon content in there and you've got your sparkle and sparkle socks are really, really fun. Um, but because it was also non-superwash, I was really inspired to include it in a sweater. And of course, the first sweater that came to mind that is really designed to show off an incredibly special yarn and that a lot of people have been using to show off hand-dyed yarns with you know, lots of speckles and interesting things going on um, and sparkly bits and just all of that uh, is the swag. I'd seen a lot of swags. I knew that it would only take one skein of the, um, of this colorway. And so I could go and find a main color and uh, it would work perfectly as a sweater, even though I only had one skein of it. So I knew that I wanted that. And I thought that the best thing for it would be a brown. Um, and I don't usually think of myself as a huge brown person, although I do, uh, <laughs> I've knit a few different brown things. I tend to kind of be in a brown mood when we're getting into fall, apparently. Um, but I initially thought that what I really wanted was like a tweed, because I thought that the contrast of the tweed with the speckles as sort of two different ways to bring in um, alternate colors would be really interesting. And of course I thought Brooklyn Tweed right away. And for a long time I thought I would use Brooklyn Tweed Loft, but I just couldn't settle on the right shade of brown. And I realized that I thought it was because they didn't have exactly the shade of brown that I wanted it to be. So then I decided that I would look at some Shetland Spindrift because I love Shetland yarn. And I ended up going with that. So this is um, Jameson's of Shetland, Shetland Spindrift, which is also um, non-superwash. Of course it is Shetland. It is designed for color work, which there's a little bit of color work in this sweater, although it's not super color work forward. Um, but one of the things that's so special about their yarn is their colors and how they just beautifully blend just some really interesting, subtle notes of, um, unexpected colors into some of their neutral colorways. So this one is called Moorland and it's got some blues in there with the brown and this of course has some blue speckles and I thought that they just really belonged together. So I um, ordered a bunch of this. I actually got 10 of these and um, according to the pattern, that's gonna make me just short. Uh, I would have gotten 11, but they only had 10 in stock on the website um, where I got them from, I think it was Love Knitting. So um, I'm not super worried about it. 
think it's probably going to be fine. If it's not fine, I'll just order another one somewhere. Um, but I think it's probably going to be fine. I usually have yarn left over. I tend to try to play it safe. So, we'll see. Maybe I'll make it a little bit shorter. A lot of times Caitlin Hunter's patterns are a little bit more oversized, uh, longer sleeves, longer body than I personally would do. So, we'll find out. But I've got this, so I've got all the yarn ready to go. I've got the pattern printed out, and um, I'm going to be starting on that shortly. I kind of thought I would just go ahead and get started on it before I <laughs> finish the wispy, um, because I know that I will finish the wispy. It's not going to hold me back. Um, but now that I'm so close to finishing the wispy, and I haven't had a chance to pick this up and get started on it yet, I might just go ahead and get that off my needles first. I don't know. So that's my next big project. Um, I also am making plans for the next sweater I want to knit after that, um, which is the Wool and Honey by Andrea Mallory. So it's just this gorgeous pattern. I saw it, um, I can't remember if I saw it on Instagram or Ravelry first, but I immediately knew I had to make it because uh, it's a yoked pullover, which is like my favorite thing right now. And it is all these hexagons, um, which I'm completely obsessed with hexagons, uh, which you probably noticed because my table is a hexagon and my little watermark on here is a hexagon and that's just like my signature thing. So, um, I knew I wanted to make it. Right after I saw it, uh, I saw that um, Caitlin of Wool Jewel is actually knitting one. Uh, she's probably done with it by now because she knits up sweaters in like a flash. Um, so uh, she's having a lot of fun with hers. Um, and it's funny because I feel like I always end up knitting like so many of the same sweaters that Caitlin knits because um, I just be a very similar taste, I guess. Um, but yeah, so hers is looking gorgeous and I really want to make it. I really want to go just full on embrace the honeycomb concept and knit it out of Hayloft, um, Brooklyn Tweed Loft in the colorway Hayloft, which is just like this really, really special mustard color, which I've wanted to knit a sweater out of um, for a while. So I think this will be the perfect one. I really love a mustard yellow sweater, um, mustard yellow anything really, but yeah, so I want to do that uh, after the swag, and then, and then I finish these socks. I need to cast on another pair of socks, because um, I like to have a nice little portable, slightly mindless thing, although I say mindless, but I'm thinking I... I'm in the mood for some textured socks. I have been knitting vanilla socks for a while now. Uh, when I first started this show, I knit lots of complicated socks. Um, it was like a thing I was known for. Um, and then at some point, socks became my mindless travel knitting thing and I, I got really into just doing a lot of vanilla ones. And I love vanilla socks, but Lately, I think because I'm on just a plain stockinette portion of the Sunset Highway, um, the Wispy is all stockinette. These socks were all stockinette. I've just been, like, I needed a lot of stockinette for a while, which I've talked about. Um, but I think I finally hit, like, peak mindless knitting, and I need something more interesting, which is why I'm really excited to start this Zweig because it's going to have so much going on with the yoke, and then even when you get into the body and the sleeves, you still have texture that's, like, easily memorizable, but it's at least something to do. Um, <laughs> and I think that's sort of what I want for my next sock. Uh, I want it to be something that is simple, but it um, gives me a little bit more something to do. So... Uh, the question is, which socks? I have three things in mind, all of which I want to do eventually, and the question is really, what am I going to be doing next? So, 
And the first thing that came to mind is I've been wanting to do the Clark socks, which are designed by Jacqueline Salem, Salem, excuse me. Um, and I want to do them with this beautiful fiber for the people uh, yarn. This is a Lucky Strike colorway, which is a one of a kind that she called Gingerbread, which I got from her last Christmas. And it's just got like sort of a mauve running through this baked, you know, gingery color and some red speckles in it. A uh, really, really interesting yarn. I like it a lot. Um, and I think it would be beautiful as the Clark socks because they have a kind of, not complicated, but like a really showcased cable situation that I think would be great on a, um, on more of a semi-solid. Uh, I do think that they might not be completely a memorizable pattern. Um, intuitive, yes, but maybe not memorizable. So if I start those, uh, they might not fit exactly the bill of what I need because sometimes I need something that's 100% mindless, but I don't know. I still think I might go for those. Um, my sock right now, like if I'm not taking it to uh, seminars, which I'm not right now because I'm I I don't have residency until January. Um, it, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent mindless because it's really just something I knit on uh, when I'm like hanging out with family or something like that, or like stuck in traffic um, <laughs> or whatever, or like when I'm early to something a few minutes early. So it's not like it has to be something that. I don't have to think about it at all. So, um, yeah, I think that could work. The other pattern, just last night, I bought the Taunus sock pattern by Becky Sorensen because this weekend she's running um, a uh, fundraiser where she's donating part of her proceeds to um, a uh, eating disorder um, nonprofit in the name of a friend of hers who passed away a couple of years ago. And I really like the Taunus socks. Oh, I picked up the wrong yarn. Um, <laughs> I was gonna show you something. I really like the Taunus socks, uh, and I think they would be really, really beautiful with the rest of this um, the rest of this, which is dress knits sparkly uh i smell snow which i'm using in my sunset highway so it's just super super subtle pale beautiful um which i think would show off that texture really well i think tommy of squirrel pie productions did those socks in kind of a pale pink and so i think that's why that color is like sticking in my mind as something that would be really beautiful for that um, texture. And then the third thing is um, last summer I got this gorgeous junk yarn. This is her Brigitte colorway. I think it's inspired by Brigitte Bordeaux. Um, and I picked this up immediately with inspiration for a pair of textured socks that I wanted to design myself got these gorgeous speckles, but most of it is, um, you know, just this peach. So it would be great for texture. Uh, and I have an idea of what I would want those to be. Obviously being a design, that's going to take even more brain power. Um, <laughs> but I've been really wanting to do these for a while. So of course that is in the back of my mind as an option as well. Um, these two actually look really lovely together but I'm not as much of a shawl knitter as I am a sock knitter, so I really want them both to be cable socks instead. Anyway, um, so some kind of textury socks are coming up. Um, speaking of designing, the other thing I wanted to talk about, um, and uh, this will take me into chit chat, is the whale's yarn. So I mentioned when I picked up this gorgeous Shetland yarn, uh, which was raised in Caradigian, the county in Wales uh, that was my home base for most of my time there. Um, it's just gorgeous stuff. I picked up four skeins of this. Uh, I think it's going to be a DK or a worsted. I have to figure that out. Um, 
and I want to design a Shaw inspired by whales out of it. So I really do not have the time or the brain power right now to be doing that, and yet I can't stop thinking about it. I have ideas that keep me up at night. I've sort of let myself at least get started with inspiration, um, kind of sketching, kind of searching for and earmarking different um, textures that might be involved in it. Uh, and then, you know, maybe I will find some time at some point to actually get started, or maybe I will sort of be responsible, continue to use my free time for school, and put this on the back burner until um, I get a little bit more brain space uh, after Thanksgiving. I don't know. But what I need to do, first of all, before I can start the full, you know, getting started on the design, is figure out what weight this yarn really is. And I think that the way I'm going to do that is, um, I know this is 100 grams, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just put it on a swift, kind of count how many times it goes around, and then measure the length of that, do the math, try to figure out how long it is, and then also knit a swatch. And with all of that information, I think I should be able to calculate um, how it should be knitting up. And the reason that I want to know what weight it is, is I want to get an idea of um, how big I can make this design with the yarn that I have so that I use most of it, but not, um, but I don't run out. Um, and yeah, so I need to do that at some point. That's, uh, you know, not really that complicated, but uh, it's going to take a little bit of brain power and free time. Um, and I know that I want this to be a uh, um, crescent-shaped shawl because that's my favorite shape to wear. Um, and I feel like designing a crescent shape is going to be a little bit more complicated than if I were just doing like a straight triangle. So that I think is going to take a little bit of brain power to figure out how to do the textures and do the shaping that I want. Um, but I pretty much decided that's what I want. So we'll see. I think I'm going to get um, an ebook that I saw that's about designing uh, Shaw's and kind of gives you a lot of the math and stuff to uh, get you started with that. And um, as I said, I have been looking at textures and kind of um, marking things. And that brings me to this. I wanted to show you these uh, books that I've been going through. So, um, basically, I want the Shaw to be inspired by whales in that I want to use textures that remind me of various things about the landscape, um, the wildflowers, all the moss-covered stone walls, and the ocean, uh, really being the things that stand out to me the most. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of look at a lot of textures and see what they sparked in me and what things reminded me of that landscape. Now, I actually did not have any stitch dictionaries. I used to have a stitch dictionary when I was like in high school, but um, I don't know, either it's still in my parents' house or it's gone, who knows. But <laughs> I got on Amazon and I was looking at things and I ended up just ordering three of them so that I would just have a feast of options. Obviously, these are going to help me with um, future designs as well because I really am getting excited about the idea of designing definitely some socks that would be really natural for me, but um, at least this Shaw and maybe more Shaw. So I got this, which um, everyone has raved about and I've seen some images from, and I just knew I wanted it. I wasn't sure. It seemed like a lot of the stuff might be a little bit more complicated than what I wanted for the whale shawl, but it would definitely make for some awesome socks and just awesome everything. Um, so that's the Japanese Knitting Stitch Bible. And just to give you a bit of an idea of some of the amazing stuff in here, there are these really great, like, borders which I love. Um, you've got some really cool stuff here where it helps you 
shape like that would go would work really well for like a yoke the way that it they're designed to um decrease or increase or what have you and uh different like panels that you can put together in different combinations lots of cable-y stuff but just a sort of new way of looking at cables you know just a more a lot of like cables working together with a ribbing like here um just some very very cool intricate beautiful stuff in here um lots of cables working with eyelets and just lots of baubles which i love um so yeah really cool book there and then these are both just mega stitch dictionaries um and i have been folding down some corners of some pages for things that uh either that i just like or that specifically feel like they might um like this little wave situation i thought could work for the uh the whale's shawl because it reminds me of the ocean and also of the rolling hills um, when you get up high somewhere and you look down. Um, this is a two color slip stitch situation. So I don't know that it would necessarily read similarly in a single color, but obviously that reminds me of the rough walls. So um, I'd already been thinking if some kind of texture like that might be cool. I really just love these raised diamonds here and that just has a quality to it that reminds me of some of the the landscape and the flowers there this one is not necessarily um for whales although it does remind me of the tide coming in and of the rolling mountains but these pleats i also just really really love um so i could definitely see using them in the shawl or in something else um and then this of course reminds me of some of the like seed and flower gone to seed gone to flower sort of grasses and all the beautiful meadows everywhere um so lots of cool stuff in there i mean i like flipped through that for a few minutes and i marked all of those already i haven't even really uh given it enough time and then um this guy i have like barely even looked at so far but it's really great everything is organized uh into so you've got like knit and purl stitches so textures that just use knit and purl You've got cable and errand stitches, lace and eyelet stitches, color work stitches, and then edgings and turns. So you can really just turn to whatever section you like. And it's got some great stuff in there. Um, yeah, like this guy. I think that would make a really, really beautiful edge for the, um, the whale's shawl. This guy's really cool too. Look at those loops. I mean, like, so I am just super, super excited. I love, I love, love, love designing. And I like think about it all the time. And it's just so hard to actually find the time for it because it's, so different than like knitting in that it's not a thing that I can just do to relax or that I can just pick up and set down um or that I can do when my brain is exhausted and so it's really been driving me crazy for like the last year at least that I have so many ideas and um just trying to stay uh disciplined about not just like taking a whole weekend and working on something like this um, and instead like working on school. <laughs> so I think what I really need to do to keep from going crazy is to just actually start carving out time that is for this and uh, you know stop telling myself like you have to wait because the inspiration is there, the obsession is there, I'm going to be spending my time thinking about it and the only way to really release that energy is to actually put it into the work um, so that's why I'm thinking that you know I'm at least letting myself start with the sketching portion 
of the uh, of the Shaw and may not get to the more complicated parts um, until a little bit later. But for the sock, I mean, I think I can just get going on that. So that's why I'm kind of thinking I might do that next um, because I think it'll help satisfy that urge that I have to um, sort of scratch that design itch that is just always going on in the back of my brain. Yeah. So anyway, I guess that's all I have for you today. Um, thanks for stopping by again. And um, I am uh, excited to, to uh, show you probably lots of new stuff the next time um, we hang out because I'm going to have that sweater done and the next sweater started and some kind of sock situation going on. So, um, yeah. And if you have any tips for um, figuring out the weight of this, in addition to uh, what I mentioned I'm planning on doing, or just any kind of watch outs about that, any advice, um, would love to hear it. I am likely not going to be able to record again um, <laughs> for about four weeks. So I should see you back here at the beginning of September. Um, I will be on Instagram in the meantime. I will be on Ravelry checking in on uh, the knit along as I can. Um, and we will have a winner to announce then. Um, and, you know, if you are wanting to make plans for what to get started on for the next round, um, don't cast on until after September 1st. But on September 1st, you can cast on for the uh, anything but merino portion. And the rule for that is you need to know the breed. So it can't just say, well, it needs to tell you what um, specific breed of sheep it is. And it needs to be a breed that is not merino. So, yeah. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys then. Enjoy the rest of your summer. And I guess when I see you, it'll not technically be fall and it won't feel like fall but i'm pretty sure pumpkin spice lattes will be available starting september 1st and we all know that's really the true fall equinox um in the knitters world at least so i guess i will see you guys in fall <laughs>